So there are three driving questions um, to the use of models uh, in nutrient reduction strategies and planning that overarch uh, the technical uncertainties that were raised in uh, the Puget Sound Partnership Marine Water Quality Implementation Strategy that many of you have been involved as scientific advisors on this process. And it's really intended as a follow-up uh, to address those uncertainties. Um, our approach really here is twofold. How can we reduce the uncertainties and improve the confidence in predictions to support actions now? And then longer term, uh, to identify gaps um, in future combined modeling and monitoring. We really share many of the same challenges with you guys. And the potential cost of this is such that it's really important to understand how do we have place-based conversations about these challenges. We realize that we also um, are sort of staring at the fact that we have limited long-term support for monitoring and modeling that have that can inform management actions now, um, as well as when we think about the monitoring data that we do have, it tends to be most rich in the physics and to a lesser extent on the chemistry. And the, what is probably the most scarce is the um, understanding of what's happening with our biological communities. So where do you, where and when do you see these impacts? Um, I think the message to you guys is that it's really about the process for how you assemble um, your partners, how you assemble your tools, um, and how you can um, work together to have the conversations that can ultimately um, lead you towards cost-effective solutions for the problems that you're trying to identify. So in Southern California, I think another part of this sort of willing partnership is we have a 50-year partnership of regulated water, um, uh, uh, water quality agencies, the regulators, US EPA, Cal P um, EPA, as well as the Ocean Protection Council, that's sort of moving from this sort of uh, question whether or not nutrients could have an impact and now demonstrating that they are indeed having an impact. And we thought as we took the first cut at this that we were done, um, but ultimately um, our stakeholders really pushed back and um, really wanted to make sure that they were able to weigh in and actually specify the metrics and gradients that they thought were really important to run this model through its paces in order to make sure that the model was credible for these um, uh, pollution, pollution applications within the Southern California Bight. And I think that it's been a, um, a process to get our um, stakeholders on board with this model. I don't think we're there yet, actually. But I thought what was really interesting when we had this workshop in which we pulled together a number of notable um, scientists and modelers uh, and managers who from different parts of the world have been in, um, uh, investing in the use of models to guide management conversations, that some of the things that um, some of the things were not surprising, for example, but other things were um, I were I was um, anticipating less. The, um, you haven't heard about any management decisions in Southern California at this point. At this point, is because our managers in looking at the science that we've done so far, said it's not enough just to document chemical changes. We'd really like to understand how these chemical changes are being manifest in biological effects. And the problem that California have and, and that many people have along the coastline is that our existing water quality objectives or criteria um, are not really plug and play um, for this type of application. Or what a lot of people wanna know is, well, is that real? So ultimately, we really have to come back and not only validate our models, but also validate the predictions on biological effects. And we do that by having coupled chemical biological effects observations. Here's a really, here's a good example of some of those types of questions that we've been working on um, with our managers in concert with scientists along the coastline. So should you worry about multiple stressors, things like, um, 
uh, how these responses can co-vary with things like temperature. And what's, what, what happens when you start to lay out these questions in this way, you can really identify what are the technical questions that scientists need to weigh on and what are the um, questions or issues that are, that are policy decisions. Um, um, we haven't gotten this guidance from our managers yet. We haven't. Ha we don't have the clarity in our interpretation framework, and so the, our science team has actually constructed, essentially, a synthesis of thresholds in order to be able to, um, essentially, illustrate how the choices in thresholds of acidification or oxygen loss can ultimately. Um, uh, impact the results of, um, and so when we apply these thresholds, we're essentially then um, looking at our change metric of habitat compression. So this is different than sort of a percent change in, in natural background. We're actually looking at the compression of habitats um, in the Southern California Bight as a result of anthropogenic or land-based inputs is that I think it's really important that we not just focus on nutrients, um, that there are innovative options out there that are beyond nutrient management alone. They can be living solutions that enhance coastal resiliency, for example, restoration of seagrass and kelp, or even aquaculture that are shed an estuarine restoration um, in which we're essentially rebuilding um, and restoring the natural um, geomorphology um, and the hydrology that, of these systems that, are, that can really contribute towards eutrophication. So it's not just a nutrient loading problem, it's also a physical habitat disturbance, a hydro modification problem. So we should think more broadly about what these solutions can be. Our water quality managers um, don't, always necessarily um, feel that they need to have revised standards in order to proceed with a management action um, in which the science um, of biological effects is compelling, in which there's a strong linkage between those impacts and um, something that they feel is within their jurisdiction. When you guys are, are dealing with uncertainty, are you kind of approaching it from the perspective of, okay, we've, we understand the uncertainty and we think it's good enough and therefore we're going to just kind of go forward and leave the uncertainty issue behind? Or is the approach more one that's maybe more probabilistic? But there is probably a difference of opinion among managers um, how far we have to go in characterizing that uncertainty relative to how quickly they would like to be able to make a decision on this problem. So the quick answer is it's a little of both, but I would put a really heavy emphasis on just an honest characterization of uncertainty. Honestly, one of the most challenging parts of this discussion of, you know, guiding and using models to inform nutrient management is um, assembling a credible framework for interpreting biological effects. So this, if this feels like hard, a hard thing to do, everyone is struggling with it. We're by Thomas Eddy and, and Gobbler, which in which they're sort of challenging. Um, you know, our current approach to regulating um, oxygen and pH um, due to the fact that, you know, we have kind of a brave new world of climate change um, and this natural baseline of, of, of variability is really shifting. So I've been working for the last 15 years to try to use an approach called the Virginia province approach, which is the commonly accepted method by regulators to develop site-specific dissolved oxygen criteria. So what I've sort of encountered is that there are a lot of scientific challenges of this. First of all, there's very little data to define sublethal endpoints for Pacific West Coast species. The, um, this approach also does not consider multiple st um, stressors. And so the recommendations um, that I would have for you guys as we sort of wade through this issue together, consider then as you engage with policymakers, they're going to be wedded with their paradigms. But as scientists, then what we've done is say, well, let's compare those um, the output from things like the Virginia province approach with other approaches um, that may be a bit more modern. Basically, when, when you do some tests, the ones that are in respiration stress, where, where scientists would say that's a chronic impact, 
but they're so stressed they have no reaction to predation. Mm -hmm. they're, they're in respiration stress, and that goes chronic to acute. The fact that DO is not acting uh, in by itself, and that the way the questions and research actions are framed is that it's not considering uh, interactive or cumulative impacts of other stressors. And is that number one? I don't hear a lot of consensus yet around the problem statement in Puget Sound. What is the problem? Is low DO really a, a, really a problem? Um, and what evidence do you have for that? Do you also have other evidence that other sort of eutrophication impacts are occurring, harmful algal blooms, um, acidification? Um, so the list could be long, um, you know, impacts to your benthic habitat. So I think using um, your scientific community to synthesize uh, an updated understanding of the problem statement probably really seems to be important here. And so I refer to these four sources of uncertainty as sort of the, the usual suspects. Uh, nothing new to nothing new here um, to most modelers. And so we use a, a automated uh, multi-objective evolutionary algorithm, uh, MOIA for short, that optimizes overall model performance for for multiple outputs. And the point is to uh, reduce the problem of equifinality um, uh, such that uh, the MOIA systematically disqualifies solutions for which calibrated parameters provide the right answers for the wrong reasons. We're really looking forward to the next uh, several years where there's a project that's been funded to, to work on this um, uh, multi-model framework. Uh, these won't be the only models. We certainly hope that um, Sparrow and, and uh, DHSVM and other models that are being uh, used uh, can weigh in on this. We believe in model comparisons. We learn from each other. Um, you know, what are the watershed uncertainties that are shared across different modeling efforts? These, these, these breakout groups are intended not to solve all these questions or to go do a deep dive, but rather to get the wheels turning. We intend to have workshops later in the year on, you know, a full workshop on this topic. So um, the source, the ocean source water is, is, you know, very important. And uh, so its variability is likely to be quite important. Um, I think it's a really interesting and open question for, from the point of view of what we're here to talk about if, is whether or not the variability of the ocean source water is important for uncertainty estimates. And then last thoughts about um, generally for biogeochemical modeling, there's things that we have a lot less knowledge about than we should in order to be doing this job right. At first, we thought this is strictly heating of marine heat, you know, the strictly heating effect from marine heat wave. Uh, then we thought, hey, it's a combination of marine heat wave and hydrology because we have made the assumption so far that hydrology is not affected by heat wave. But now we also recognize that much of the strength of exchange flow that comes in through state of Andafuka is, is controlled by Fraser River. And Fraser River is a snow melt model uncertainty. All models have uncertainty. CLC model is not any different from that. At a detailed uncertainty analysis is warranted. So we call models, there are places where we know we can improve higher resolution in some cases, but improved calibration for some of the constituents. I should know the answer to this, but I don't, so I'll just ask in public. So the 20% decline in dissolved oxygen over that time period on the coastal water, is that decline expected to continue? How is climate change expected to change coastal upwelling intensity and nutrient inputs? was that there's a huge gap in the spatial and temporal resolution of phytoplankton species in abundance. Other big gaps are in rates. Hypotheses around these changes and how we can begin to test these. The shift in nutrient balance, for instance, the decline of silicate to nitrogen, we could be seeing a shift from a diatom-based food web to a microbial-based food web. These blooms can clear out the entire water column of chlorophyll. And so one of the hypotheses is that then the organic matter is kept in the surface layer 
and results in the more uh, gelatinous type of food web, which keeps nutrients and organic matter in the surface. It's a lower quality food. It can affect the upper trophic levels of the food web. The communities could be in decline, and the hypothesis is that there's less organic matter making it to certain parts of the basins and regions that could be affecting those communities. So we're not really looking at benthic diatoms, particularly in some of these near shore and shallow areas and it's exploiting the data sets you know so everybody has data sets but we struggle to get the analysis you know where is it light limited how often where is it nutrient limited how often where is it grazing limited how often we have a lot of data from shallow water systems i think there's a first step for these areas where we don't have the model um, well um, addressed is to exploit what we can from the data to we were looking to prioritize the parts of the physical system, then make the availability of nutrients to the euphotic zone.